What's up, y'all? Welcome back to the Onyx Reports Black Masculinist News for the day. Hope everybody is well. Um, let's see here. This looks like it's a little out of focus. All right. So today we're going to get into one Mumia Abu Jamal. Um, and today we're going to do a little bit of an introduction. This is not going to be super in depth. Um, I just kind of want to really just kind of do my part to help introduce a new generation to who the man is because he's still in the news and he's in the news for a reason. And I thought it important to at least chime in. Now I'll start with why he's in the news now and then kind of work backward about why he's relevant and who he is. Um, and as I said, this is going to be a very surface introduction. I hope that many of you will de delve in, look him up, read about him, listen to his interviews, a lot of which, you know, were conducted over the phone because the man has been incarcerated for nearly, for, for 40 years now. <clears throat> Nevertheless, uh, this is the man who has currently been in incarcerated for 40 years and he's suffering health issues. He was diagnosed last month with covid and which has led to the need for heart surgery. He lost 30 pounds in March alone. Um, so hold on, let me put him up so you can actually get a look at who he is. So this is him. This is when he's relatively healthy. Mumia Abu Jamal, brilliant journalist, activist. You know, this is him now. This is what he's uh, he's grappling with. So it's as of a, a couple of days ago, he was supposed to have undergone heart surgery. I have not seen the results of that yet. Uh, but by the time you see this, hopefully uh, there will be something public about it. But as I said, he's grappling with COVID-19. He's grappling with heart conditions, uh, heart issues. But who is he? Right. So <clears throat> let me see. Let me back up here. All right. So it, 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 this, is a, this is a man who was raised in Philadelphia, uh, was born Wesley Cook and in 1968 took on an African name after being inspired by a Kenyan uh, teacher in a class he took. Uh, from that point, uh, right, late 60s, but still 68 or so, he became active. He joined the Black Panther Party, even at one point uh, advocating for Mao Zedong's notion of political power growing out of the barrel of a gun. So he had no problem with the relationship between political activism and uh, violence, which, uh, you know, at the time inspired by Malcolm, you know, many of us began to uh, us because I'm not that old, <laughs> but many began to uh, reflect on whether or not nonviolence was in and of itself becoming a form of um, uh, limited expression was was limiting expression and limiting the potential for amassing political power. Um, but since that point, he dropped out of high school, went and actually worked with the Panthers in Oakland uh, for a good while, right around 1970s, 1970, excuse me. Um, you know, was subject to the surveillance and the, the goings ons of the FBI's COINTELPRO program, uh, saw how that began to under, undermine and underdevelop uh, the Black Panther Party. He left the party, came back to Philly, uh, went back to high school you know, uh, was was uh, harassed about his politics and things he was trying to do. Uh, he was suspended for distributing literature that was uh, calling for black revolutionary student power. Right. And from that point, uh, ended up leaving, getting his GED, studied briefly at Goddard College in Vermont, uh, went back to Philly, married several times, uh, married three times over his lifetime up through 1981. Um, uh, was married to three women. So the first of whom was Marilyn in 77, uh, had a son. Um, uh, let me see. So I'm, oh, I skipped the first one. Excuse me. Uh, let me see. Let's see. Uh, he married Biba in 73, uh, but they weren't together long. Um, he married Marilyn secondly in 77 and then, uh, had a son with her and then married, uh, um, uh, Wadia. Uh, in 81, I believe it is. All right. So he was also known for being a journalist. And this is one of his, his, his big contributions, aside from being a Panther, being an activist, was transferring his activism into his journalism, uh, mainly a radio journalist who also did cab driving on the side to make ends meet. Uh, he was known for being an active supporter and then 
activists in the organization move, right? Um, now, he, he, he operated with several local stations, particularly at Temple University, eventually working with National Public Radio, NPR, uh, very outspoken. But when MOVE came on the scene, founded by John Africa, uh, this became uh, a really a, a, a foundational point for him. He joined the organization. You know, he was known for high profile interviews with Julius Irving, Bob Marley, Alex Haley, so on and so forth. He was president of the Philadelphia Association of Black Journalists. But MOVE was probably one of his biggest moves uh, Moves um, in terms of joining the organization. He reported on them. Um, he said it was mainly because of his love uh, for the people in the organization that he joined. Um, and was witness to uh, what took place. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Um, okay. Okay. So MOVE was a, was a commune in West Philly um, that was uh, kind of African-centered, African-based. Um, and from it, as I said, founded by John Africa, he was, man, the page. There we go. There we go. Disappeared on me for a second. I had to open it, open it up again. Um, so MOVE in and of itself started out as a Christian movement organization, but it was mainly it became a militant black separatist group. Uh, that advocated for natural laws and natural living, founded in 1972 uh, by John Af uh, Africa, um, and basically had to do. Move was not an acronym; it was based on you know just the concept that in nature things continue to move and grow and develop. Um, so, so from there, you know they kind of developed into a, a revolutionary ideology similar to the Panthers, uh, with work for am animal rights. Uh, so this was something that, uh, you know, uh, Mumia was inspired by and became active in it, most particularly um, when he reported on the 1979 to 80 trial of certain members, also referred to as the Move Nine, who were convicted of the murder of police officer James Rant. Um, you know, um, so he kind of covered it uh, from that vantage point. Now, the reason that he comes into um, importance in this regard is because of one night, right? Uh, having to do with a traffic stop and the eventual death of Officer uh, uh, Daniel Faulkner. So basically, 3.55 a.m. on December 9th, 1981, in Philadelphia, close to the intersection of 13th and Locust Streets, Philadelphia Police Department Officer Daniel Faulkner conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle belonging to and driven by William Cook, who was Ab uh, Abu Jamal's younger brother. Faulkner and Cook became engaged in physical confrontation, Driving his cab in the vicinity, uh, Abu Jamal observed the altercation parked, ran across the street toward Cook's car. Faulkner was shot in the back and face. He shot Abu Jamal in the stomach. Faulkner died at the scene from the gunshot wound to his head. Arrest and trial, right? Police arrived and arrested Abu Jamal, who was found to be wearing a shoulder holster. His revolver, which had spent five cartridges, was beside him. He was taken directly from the scene of the shooting to Thomas Jefferson University Hospital, where it was said that he was beaten uh, along the way, of course, where he received treatment for his wound. He was next taken to police headquarters where he was charged and held in trial, uh, held for trial in the, uh, in the first degree murder of Officer Faulkner, right? Um, so the, the prosecution presented four witnesses to the court about the shootings, all of whom testified for the most part that either it was him directly, Abu Jamal, who committed the crime, or that it was someone that looked, that he fit the description of, right? So these were, came from four basic witnesses, uh, and they all testified and so on and so forth. And within three hours of reflection, he was sentenced to death. Three hours of deliberation, he was sentenced to death um, and has been incarcerated for 40 years, right? Since 1981. However, in 99, Arnold Beverly uh, claimed that he and an unnamed assailant, not Abu, Abu Jamal, shot Daniel Faulkner as part of a contract killing because Faulkner was interfering with graft and payoff to corrupt police. As Abu Jamal's defense team prepared another appeal in 2001, they were divided over use of the Beverly affidavit. Some thought it usable, others rejected Beverly's story as not credible. Um, Private investigator George Newman claimed in 01 that Schobert had recanted his testimony. Com it was one of the four people that testified against him. Commenters noted that um, police and news photographs of the crime scene did not show Schobert's, Schobert's taxi and, and that Cynthia White, the only witness at the original trial to testify to seeing the taxi, had previously provided crime scene depictions that omitted it. 
Cynthia White was declared to be dead by the state of New Jersey in 92, but Pamela Jenkins claimed that she saw White alive as late as 97. The Free Mumia Co Coalition has claimed that White was a police informant and that she has falsified her testimony against Abu Jamal. Uh, Kenneth Pate, who was imprisoned with Abu Jamal on other charges, has since claimed that his stepsister Priscilla Durham, a hospital security guard, admitted later she had not heard the so-called hospital confession by Abu Jamal where he supposedly admitted to killing them and was glad that he did. Uh, she apparently admitted later she had not heard that to which she had testified in trial. The hospital doctor said that Abu Jamal was on the verge of fainting when brought in and they did not hear any such confession. In 08, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania rejected a further request from Abu Jamal for a hearing into claims that the trial witnesses perjured themselves on the grounds that he waited too long before filing the appeal. On March 26, 2012, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania rejected his appeal for retrial. His defense had asserted, based on the 09 report by the National Academy of Sciences, that forensic evidence presented by the prosecution and accepted into evidence in the original trial was unreliable. This was reported as Abu Jamal's last legal appeal. In April 30th, on April 30th, 2018, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruled Abu Jamal would not be immediately granted another appeal and that the proceedings had to continue until August 30th of that year. The defense argued that former Pennsylvania Supreme Court Chief Justice Ronald Castile should have recused himself from the 2012 appeals decision after his involvement as Philadelphia District Attorney in the 1989 appeal. Both sides of the 2018 proceedings repeatedly cited a 1990 letter sent by Castile to then Governor Bob Casey, urging Casey to sign the execution warrants of those convicted of murdering police. This letter demanding Casey send a clear and dramatic message to all cop killers was claimed one of the many reasons to suspect Castile's bias in the case. Philadelphia's current DA, Larry Krasner, stated he could not find any documents supporting the defense's claim. On August 30th, uh, 2018, the proceedings to determine another appeal were once again extended and a ruling on the matter was delayed for at least 60 more days. All right? <clears throat> so hold on one moment. All right. So uh, the Free Mumia Coalition published statements by William Cook and his brother Abu Jamal in spring 01. Uh, let's see, Cook claimed, uh, Cook, who had been stopped by the police officer, this is Abu Jamal's brother, um, had not made any statement before 2001 and did not testify at his brother's trial. In 01, he said that he had not seen who had shot Faulkner. He himself, uh, I believe, had been shot in the face at that point. Um, no, I'm sorry. That was that was Faulkner. My bad. <clears throat> Let's see. That was Faulkner. My bad. That wasn't his brother. All right. So here we go. Um, in his version of events, he claimed that he was sitting in his cab across the street when he heard the shouting, saw a police vehicle and, and heard the gun, sound of gunshots. Upon seeing his brother appearing disoriented across the street, Abu Jamal ran to him from the parking lot and was shot by a police officer. In 01, Judge William Yone Jr. of the United States uh, District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania upheld the conviction saying Abu Jamal did not have the right to a new trial, but he vacated the sentence of death on December 18th, 01, citing irregularity, irregularities in the penalty phase of the trial and the original process of sentencing. Um, particularly, he said that the jury instructions and verdict sheet in the case involved an unreasonable application of federal law. The charge and verdict form created a reasonable likelihood that the jury believed it was precluded from considering any mitigating circumstances that had not been found unanimously to exist. He ordered the state of Pennsylvania to commence new sentencing proceedings within 180 days and ruled unconstitutional the requirement that a jury be unanimous in its finding of cir uh, circumstances mitigating against a sentence of death. Um, let's see. Let's move forward a little bit here. Uh, on December 6, 05, the Third Circuit Court of Appeals admitted four issues for appealing for for appeal of the ruling of the district court. Um, and uh, by December 7, 011, 011, December 7, 2011. Uh, District Attorney Philadelphia R. Seth Williams announced that prosecutors with the support of the victim's family would no longer seek the death penalty for Abu Jamal and would accept a sentence of life imprisonment without parole. The sentence was reaffirmed by, by the Superior Court of Pennsylvania in 2013. 
Um, after the press conference uh, on the sentence, widow Maureen Faulkner said that she not, did not want to relive the trauma of another trial. She understood that it would be extremely difficult to present the case against Abu Jamal again after the passage of 30 years and the deaths of several key witnesses. She also reiterated her belief that Abu Jamal um, will be punished further after death. So, let me see here. This is a picture of, of Officer Faulkner. I'm sorry, Officer Faulkner there, um, whom there's some contention about in regard to who actually killed him. Right. This is one of those old cases, much like with Asada Shakur, where you know you have long-standing beliefs that you know some argue that he did it and has been covering it up and lying about it and all this time, and then you have others, particularly on uh, the side of the fence that I'm on. Uh, that are arguing that there's much more going on with this and Abu Jamal was not guilty of uh, actually shooting the officer. He wasn't able to, wasn't in a position to. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is an ongoing debate, as it were, and um, he is still alive. Now, in terms of his life as a prisoner, um, in 91, he published an essay in the Yale Law Journal on the death penalty and his death row experience. In May 94, was engaged by NPR, All Things Considered's program is the name of the program on NPR, to deliver a series of monthly three-minute commentaries on crime and punishment. You can find a lot of that on the Democracy Now! website. You can look for it. Um, but uh, And they're, they're in incredibly powerful. Um, this is a brilliant guy, so I suggest you look it up and listen to some of the things he has to say directly, calling in from the prison phones. Uh, the broadcast plans um, and commercial arrangement were canceled following condemn condemnations from, among others, the Fraternal Order of Police, U.S. Senator Bob Dole. Abu Jamal sued NPR for not airing his work, but a federal judge dismissed the suit. His commentaries later were published in May 95 as part of his book, Live from Death Row. At, Ap and at April 2021, he tested positive for COVID. We know that. In 96, he completed a bachelor's degree via correspondence classes at Godard College which he had attended for a time as a young man. Um, he was invited as a commencement speaker by a number of colleges and has participated via recordings. In 99, was invited to record a keynote address for the graduating class at Evergreen State College in Washington State. Um, in 2000, he recorded a commencement address for Antioch College. The now defunct New College of California School of Law presented him with an honorary degree <clears throat> for his struggle to resist the death penalty. In 2014, he gave the commencement speech at Godard College via playback of a recording. As before, the choice of Abu Jamal was controversial. Nevertheless, um, he's been doing a great deal of this work across the board. With occasional interruptions due to prison disciplinary actions, Abu Jamal has uh, for many years been a regular commentator on an online broadcast sponsored by Prison Radio. He also is published as a regular columnist for Jungle Welt, a Marxist newspaper in Germany. For almost a decade, Abu Jamal taught introductory courses in Georgist economics by correspondence to other prisoners around the world. Right? In 95, Abu Jamal was punished with solitary confinement for engaging in entrepreneurship contrary to prison regulations. Subsequent to the airing of the 96 HBO documentary Mumia Abu Jamal, A Case for Reasonable Doubt, which included footage from visitation interviews conducted with him, the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections banned outsiders from using any recorded equipment in state prisons. Um, so let me see. Oh, but this is important. I do want to add this. Following the overturning of the, his death sentence, he was sentenced to life in prison in 2011. At the end of January 2012, he was shifted from the isolation of death row into the general population. On March 30th, 2015, he suffered a diabetic shock and has been diagnosed with active hepatitis C. In uh, August 2015, his attorneys filed suit in the U.S. District Court for the Middle of District uh, for the Middle District of Pennsylvania, alleging that he has not received appropriate med medical care. Um, he is probably lauded in many circles as the most well-known known political prisoner in the world. And once you actually check out some of his interviews, you will see why. Like I said, it's a brilliant cat, long-standing activist, and represents the ongoing legacy of black male political prisoners, most particularly since the 1960s, many of whom were disappeared, um, died. Um, he represents that legacy, and he is one of the longest standing incarcerated political prisoners from that time period. 
Um, so I, I hope that you will look into him, read about him, listen, but more than anything else, actually listen to some of his interviews. If you haven't been uh, introduced to him, if you're not familiar with him, definitely check him out and do so because um, the way things are looking, his health has been deteriorating consistently. So from hepatitis C to COVID to uh, heart surgery, you know, especially if you've seen the pictures uh, and there are plenty more than the ones I've shown, but just, you know, kind of showing you the overall deterioration in his health. It is something worth checking out. This is someone you should definitely know um, and make sure that when we look at what happened to him in terms of how he was incarcerated, the assumption of, of his immediate guilt and the subsequent treatment of that, which I have only given a surface level kind of brush over about. Trust me when I tell you, and I said that at the beginning, this was not going to be a super in-depth breakdown of Mumia Abu-Jamal. This was really just going to be an introduction. But when you really get into what took place with him in his early life all the way to now, you can see that the legacy of punishing uh, and hyper punishing, as a matter of fact, the black political prisoners from this time period is so robust, is so powerful that um, it needs to be something that we openly continue to challenge. Anyway, check him out. Hope all is well. Enjoy your day. Peace, y'all.